Hi everyone, this is Zainab Zaytoun. In this video, I'll be explaining antiderivatives for grade 11. This will be the first part of this chapter. Now, for grades 12, ES, LS, and GS, uh, this will be a revision for you. Uh, so I advise you to skim the video first and see if you are confident about these kinds of antiderivatives. And if so, skip this part. For students who are watching uh, this video, uh, you should know the concept of derivative and how to find the derivative of some functions. Now the objectives of this video is to define the antiderivative of a function and find the antiderivatives of some functions. And by the way, I found this math meme on the internet saying that students are confident during derivatives, but when it comes to antiderivatives, they are not so confident. However, you should prove them wrong after watching my videos. Let's start by this activity to introduce the lesson. Find a function f of x such that f prime of x is equal to 1. So I want you to think of a function such that its derivative will give you 1. You should think of x since the derivative of x is 1. So this is one of the functions. Can you think about other functions? What about x plus 1? What's the derivative of x plus 1? Isn't it 1? What about x plus 3 over 2? x minus 5? And more generally, what about x plus c, where c is any constant? The derivative of x is 1, and the derivative of c is 0, since c is a number. So also this will give you 1. So x plus any number, the derivative of, of a function of the form x plus any number will give you 1. So all these functions work. Now, the second part, find a function g of x such that g prime of x is equal to 2x plus 1. Now pause the video and think of functions such that their derivatives will give you 2x plus 1. We know that the derivative of x squared is 2x and the derivative of x is 1. So one of the functions would be x squared plus x. Now can you find other functions? As we did in the previous one, you add any constant, any number to this function, it will also work. So x squared plus x plus 2, x squared plus x minus 3 over 4, and more generally, x squared plus x plus c, where c is a constant. The derivative of this function will be 2x plus 1 plus 0, so it will also give this form. From here, I can introduce the antiderivative, the concept of antiderivative. The antiderivative of 1 is any function such that its derivative is equal to 1. So for example, x is the antiderivative of 1 since its derivative will give you 1. Also x plus 1, x plus 3 over 2. So more generally, it's x plus c. So x plus any number. Now do the same here. What's the antiderivative of 2x plus 1? x squared plus x is an antiderivative. Same for this function. Same for this function, and also to make it more general, x squared plus x plus c is the antiderivative of 2x plus 1, where c can be any number. So let's uh, get the formal definition of the antiderivative. Let f be a function defined on an interval i of r. We call antiderivative of small f over i any function big f, we denoted it by big f, differentiable over i and such that. The derivative of big F is equal to small f. So the antiderivative of small f is another function denoted by big F such that its derivative will give you small f. So how can you prove it? Refer back to the definition. So in order to prove that big F of x is the antiderivative of small f of x, then big F of x prime should give you small f of x. So find the derivative of big F of x. The derivative of x cubed is 3x squared, and this will give you minus 2x, this will give you plus 2, and this will give you 0. So you will get this, and then 3 and 3 will cancel out, and it will be equal to small f of x. This proves that big f of x is the antiderivative of small f of x. So notice that small f of x is the derivative of big f of x. And big f of x is called the antiderivative of small f of x. So you can see that the word antiderivative explains itself. Now our goal is to be able to find the antiderivatives by ourselves. 
So before doing so, I want to introduce this notation because we will use it. Let f, big F, be the antiderivative of small f of x. We write big F of x is equal to the integral of small f of x dx. So this is how it's read. But what does it mean? Whenever you see this notation, this means that we are uh, finding the antiderivative of the function here with respect to x. So this symbol dx means that we are finding the antiderivative with respect to x. So it determines the variable. So this is all what I want you to know about this notation. I'll be doing a video later uh, explaining more about uh, these symbols. Now these are some functions that you should know how to find the antiderivative of. So for example, the first one, if a function is equal to a number. So if you want to find the integral, so now I'll be using the word integral, integral of a number with respect to x. So let's denote this number by k then the integral of k would be kx. Forget about c now. Uh, find the derivative of kx. The derivative of x is 1, so it will give you k, right? Now, what about plus c? We did the same in the first activity. So you can always add c, because the derivative of this number would be 0, so it won't change anything. So always when finding the integral, you should write plus c. So, for example, if I want to find the integral of 0 with respect to x, so apply this rule. So, here k is 0, so it will be 0x plus c, so it will only be c. Now, integral of 5 dx, also 5 is a number. The integral of a number is 5x plus c according to this rule. What about minus half x? What about the integral of minus half? It will be minus half x plus c. Now, this is another form. If the function has the form x to the power n, where n is not equal to minus 1, the integral of this function is equal to x to the power n plus 1 over n plus 1 and also plus c. So, always, always write plus c. In order to prove it, find the derivative of this function and you will get x power n. What, you are, what we are actually doing is that we are adding 1 to the power and then dividing by the new power. So for example, the integral of x squared, it's not a constant to apply this rule, but it has the form x power n, so we can apply this rule. So we add 1 to the power, and we divide by the new power, so you will get x power 3 over the new power, which is 3, and also plus c. Now, the integral of x, it's not a constant, does it have the form x power n? Yes, but what's the value of n here? So here the power is 1. So we can apply this rule. We add 1 to the power and we divide by the new power. So we get x power 2 over 2 plus c. Try to do these two by yourself. So pause the video and do them. The integral of x power minus 5. So it has the power x power n, so we apply the same rule, add 1 to the power, and then divide by the new power. So minus 5 plus 1 will give you minus 4, and you divide again by minus 4. So it's x power minus 4 over minus 4 plus c. Now what about the integral of x power 1 over 2? It has the form x power n, so again add 1 to the power and divide by the new power. So half plus 1 is 3 over 2. So it's x power 3 over 2 over 3 over 2 plus c. These are the antiderivatives of uh, trigonometric functions now. So the integral, you should know that the integral of cosine x is sine x plus c. And the integral of sine x with dx is equal to minus cosine x plus c. Why so? Because the derivative of sine x is cosine x. And the derivative of cosine x is minus sine x. So now you should know these four rules. Let's do some exercises together. Calculate the following integrals. Now I want you to pause the video and do, the, and do this by yourself. You should be able to do 1 to 4 easily. And this is a reminder for the rules that we just took, if you forgot them. So let's just start by the first part. The integral of 3. So since it's a constant, then we apply this rule. 
So you multiply it by x and you add c. So you will get 3x plus c. What about the integral of minus 2? So also since minus 2 is a constant, then you will get minus 2x plus c. Now what about x power 4? Is it a constant? Of course not. So it has the form x to the power n. So how do we do the integral of x to the power 4? We add 1 to the power and we divide by the new power. So add 1 to 4, you get 5 and you divide by 5. So it will be x power 5 over 5 plus c. Don't forget plus c. Again, x power 6, it's not a constant and it has the form x to the power n. So the integral of x to the power 6 would be x to the power 7 over 7 plus c since we added 1 to the power and divide by a new power. What about part 5? It's not a constant. Does it have the form x to the power n? No, it doesn't. It has the form 1 over x to the power n. So we can't apply this rule and you can't apply this rule for now. How can you change its form? This is a reminder. If you have 1 over x power n, it's the same as x to the power minus n. This, you should know this from previous grades. So in order to change the form of 1 over x power 3 to be of the form x to the power n, you take x to the power 3 to the numerator, but it becomes x to the power minus 3. So remember that the sign of the power flips. So it becomes the integral of x power minus 3. Now it has the form x power n. So you add 1 to the power. So minus 3 plus 1, you get minus 2. And you divide by the new power. So you divide by minus 2 plus c. Now I don't like, uh, I don't like you to keep the negative powers. So in order to make it positive again, you take it down to the denominator. So you flip its sign and it becomes x squared. Now for this negative sign, it's better to put it before the fraction. But this is still acceptable. Now, integral of 1 over x power 7. Again, you do the same as you did in part 5. So you want to take it up uh, to have the form x power n. So it will be the integral of x power minus 7. And then add 1 to the power and divide by the new power. So you'll get x power minus 6 over minus 6 plus c. Also, to, ch to get a better form of this, for this to have a positive power, you should take it down to the denominator, so it will be x power plus 6 down. And for this negative sign, you can just put it before the fraction, and plus c. Now the integral of 1 over x squared, again, it's not a constant, it doesn't have the form x power n. So, you take it, you take it to the numerator, it becomes x power minus 2, you add 1 to the power, and you divide by the new power, and then change its form. Now more exercises. The integral of radical x. Also it's not a constant and it doesn't have the form x to the power n. What can we do? How can we change its form to be of the form x to the power n? Now more exercises. The integral of radical x. So how can we find the integral of radical x? Of course it's not a constant so it should be of the form x to the power n. How can, we change it to ha how can we change it to have the form x to the power n? So this is a reminder. You should know this from grade 10. Radical x is also written as x power 1 over 2, where the number in the numerator refers to the power, since here it's x power 1, and 2 refers to the index, since the index is 2 of the radical. So you write it as x power half, and then you can do it. You add 1 to the power, so you get 3 over 2, and you divide by the new power. You do simple math to get this form and also plus c. Now how can we change this form? As I said, the number of in the numerator refers to the power and the number in the denominator refers to the index. So it becomes x power 3, radical x power 3. Now how can we simplify this? This can be split into x times x squared. So this x squared gets out as x. So you get 2 over 3x radical x plus c. Now what about 1 over radical x? So whenever you see radical x, write it as x power half. But then it's in the denominator, so you get it up as x power minus half. And do it alone to get this answer. 
That's all for this part and wait for the next part. Thanks for watching.